This is the black experience for all. Dr. Helene Gale has been president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, one of the nation's oldest and largest community foundations since October 2017. Under her leadership, the Trust has adopted a new strategic focus on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap in the Chicago region. For almost a decade, Dr. Gale was president and CEO of CARE, a leading international humanitarian organization. An expert on global development, humanitarian and health issues, she spent 20 years with the Centers for Disease Control, working primarily on HIV and AIDS. I won't keep you, um, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, you know, to talk with us at The Black Experience. And as you know, you know, The Black Experience is about telling stories of successful black people like yourself to inspire young people and to help eliminate racism. So it's an absolute honor and privilege to get a chance to talk with you. Thank you so very much. Bye, sir. So what I'd like to do is sort of jump right in and I'd like to talk about sort of your growing up and the influences of family, extended family, uh, sort of mentors, champions that sort of led you to your path on the road to medicine, Dr. Gale. Would that be possible? Sure. So, you know, I will start, I always start from family. And, you know, I grew up in a wonderful family. I was the middle child of five uh, siblings. I had a mother who was a social worker and a father who was a small business man, uh, had a store in the middle of the Black community in in Buffalo. Buffalo. And yeah, in, in Buffalo, New York. And, you know, my parents' friends were people who all of all of them had come up from the South, all very committed to, you know, paving a better way for themselves and their children, and really put a big premium on education. So, you know, for us, the, the notion that we would all have a college degree and a profession was you know, something that we grew up with. But in addition to just what we could do on our own and, and whatever professional accomplishments we could make, there was a real sense of we should also think about how do we give back to our community. So, you know, academic excellence, but also always thinking about how do we use what we have to be able to make a difference for, uh, you know, people like us and people who may or may not have the same opportunities, same experiences, but how do we make sure that we continue to use the skills and the, the opportunities we had to be able to give back to um, our community? And, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have all the incredible fields of, um, um, you know, professions that we have today. And you, you kind of grew up with, you could be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, or an undertaker. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I decided that medicine was uh, a pretty important profession because health and, and your health and well-being is such a critical core part of one's life. So, you know, I kind of opted from that range, that menu um, to think about medicine as a way that I could make a unique contribution. Yes. So I I'm curious, Dr. Gale, do you know what drew your parents uh, to Buffalo? Um, you know, Buffalo at that time was a very thriving um, Midwest uh, Rust Belt city. It had the steel mill, was a big uh, draw for employment. Um, it also had grain and, and uh, agricultural um, uh, agricultural processing is another big part of it. Uh, but each of my parents had a slightly different reason. I mean, my father had older siblings who came to Buffalo. Okay. My, um, my, and so he came as a result of that. My mother um, came when her mother, who you know, was from Richmond, Virginia, decided that she wanted to give her children more of an opportunity and she moved up to the Buffalo area. So in some form or fashion, it was all about how to 
you know, be able to give the next generation a better opportunity than what people had seen in the South. No, I appreciate that. And you talked about all of you, you and your, your brothers and sisters knew you were going to college. Had, had both of your parents gone to college, Dr. Gale? No. Well, my mother had. I mean, my mother was a graduate of Fisk University, and then okay. she went on to get a master's degree from Columbia University in social work. My father, um, you know, took the entrepreneurial route, and he did college courses on the side. He continued throughout to always want to uh, get more expertise and more skills to run his business. But he, you know, he didn't have the same degree of education that my mother did. But, uh, you know, nonetheless, both of them felt very strongly that education was, you know, in some ways the route to have greater personal options, but also the route to make a difference. Yes. What's interesting, maybe your your mother and my father might have bumped into each other in Columbia because my father got his PhD at Columbia. So they may, right. they, they may have bumped into one another. <laughs> That's one. I think my mother is a bit older than your father, but anyway. <laughs> well, he, well, he's, yeah, well, he's, well, my dad, he passed away three years ago. He was, he'd be 96 now. So, yeah. yeah. But that, but uh, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so the idea of medicine, that interest for you, when, do you recall when that sort of, you had those four options and uh, you decided medicine was going to be your route? Do you remember how early on that sort of took hold on you, Dr. Gale? Well, you know, honestly, I didn't decide to do medicine until I was in college. Um, I was a psychology major. I, I really thought very seriously about pursuing clinical psychology. And maybe that's, you know, my mother was a social worker and, you know, that that kind of uh, behavioral sciences was something that I was attracted to. But then I, you know, just started thinking practically I could do um, the six or so years to get a PhD in psychology, or I could go to medical school with the idea of being a psychiatrist and uh, again, thinking about some of those kind of behavioral issues that, you know, um, are so critical in our community. Um, and I just felt like maybe medicine would give me greater opportunities. Okay. And so then after you, after you graduate from college, so then you decide to go ahead and get your PhD in clinical psychology? Medical. MD. MD. No, I'm, I, I did not do, I decided not to do clinical psychology because I thought that going into medicine provided me maybe greater options than had I been very focused on a PhD track. And, and at that time, Dr. Gale, in terms of other women of color, black women in, and black people in general, um, how far and few between were, you know, were they at that time? Well, you know, at, at that time, uh, I laugh about it because, you know, um, if you're a black physician of a certain age, we all know each other. But people start asking me, you know, do you know so-and-so, you know, the cohort that is 10 or 15 years um, later than us? And, you know, uh, the good thing is that I don't know everybody anymore. You know, it really was a time when the numbers were so few. Um, the, you know, I went to a majority uh, medical school and um, I think African Americans were about 10% at that time. And it really hasn't budged much. Uh, so, you know, um, we still have a ways to go in terms of getting the numbers where they should be to be able to provide um, you know, the access for our community. Yes. And where did you go to school, Dr. Gale? Uh, I went to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So after you graduate there, because I, I want to get to to care and you know Chicago C Community Trust, but after you you graduate University of Pennsylvania, what sort of track do you take, you know, to move in that direction to become president and CEO at, at Care? Well, it wasn't exactly a linear route, and I never would have predict predicted that that's what I would have done, but. You know, I, during my medical school years, I, I really began to think about 
um, whether I wanted to focus on the individual patient or whether I wanted to focus more at the population level. You know, when I thought about what I could do as an individual clinician, which is great, and you take care of people and you make a big difference in individuals' lives. But I, you know, really embarked on this journey because I wanted to have broad social change. And so I started thinking maybe public health would be the route that I um, might want to pursue. And so during medical school, I did a master's in public health to give me some background in public health. I, I went on to finish my training in pediatrics. So I trained as a pediatrician. But after I finished my pediatric training, I went to the Centers for Disease Control to really focus on public health and you know, kind of preventive medicine and thought I was going there for a two-year training program and stayed for 20 years. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And sort of in retrospect, what made you stay so long? Well, you know, I came um, at the time that the HIV pandemic was just starting to roll out. Okay. And, um, you know, um, I didn't start out my time at CDC doing HIV, but, you know, within a few years, I gravitated to HIV because I really felt like it was, in many ways, the defining public health issue of our time. It was one that disproportionately impacted communities of color. And a lot of the uh, efforts to prevent the spread of HIV really meant, you know, in, in dealing with and working directly with communities. Uh, it was also a global pandemic. So I had always wanted to do global health as well. Mm -hmm. So it gave me the opportunity to really look at how HIV differentially impacted people who oftentimes were already uh, marginalized in our society uh, and, you know, both here in the United States as well as around the world. So I spent a lot of time looking at uh, HIV and how it impacted communities of color, but also how it impacted uh, people around the world and particularly the global South and Africa and Asia and the Americas and places where the interface between societal issues and this public health issue were very much um, intertwined. And when you look back on that period, Dr. Gale, what would you say in terms of the difficulties or the failings in terms of communities of color and certainly in Africa and Asia, what do you, where do you sort of pinpoint what were the difficulties or issues that you felt needed to be overcome to solve this particular problem? Well, you know, I think part of it um, is that it is so intertwined with other issues. And so, you know, for communities you know, such as the white gay community, as an example, where HIV was a really, really core issue, but it was oftentimes in populations where that may have been the only issue. Uh, and so people could singularly focus on, you know, how to make sure that population was, had the skills and the ability to, and the access to both prevent the spread and get treatment. But when you're talking about oftentimes communities of color where um, HIV might be one of multiple issues, not only multiple health issues, but also multiple economic issues. And, you know, we saw internationally that, you know, one's risk for HIV was often linked to uh, activities of economic necessity. So as an example, women who oftentimes had to put themselves in socially vulnerable and sexually vulnerable situations just to put food on the plate, uh, on the table for their children. And so, you know, when I looked at this issue of HIV and who was disproportionately impacted, it, it was either here in this country as well as around the world, intertwined with all the other aspects of life that are difficult and, uh, um, economically and socially and so you couldn't just look at HIV in a vacuum and say, you know, get people into health systems. You also had to think about 
what's the context in which people are at risk for HIV? And it's that broader yeah. social and economic context. No, th thank you for that, Dr. Gale. And sort of last question in terms of that, do you think now in retrospect that the work that you were part of was successful or are there still, are there still holes that, that need to be filled, Dr. Gale? Well, it's not successful because HIV, uh, you know, still disproportionately impacts community of color here in this country, especially young gay men of color. Um, internationally, it particularly impacts women, women who are socially and economically vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, and access to services, including some of the life-saving treatments are just not available um, oftentimes to communities where medical access is not what it should be. So all those issues still exist. But I will say that both here in this country, as well as around the world, the fact that people put such a concerted effort. One of the things I'm most proud of when I, from my time at CDC is that we got legislation from the Congressional Black Caucus and, and allies to start funding directly community-based organizations and working with the community to figure out how the community can come up with solutions for how to prevent HIV. So there's a lot of things that we learned, and I would say a lot of things that we learned that we should have used for this current pandemic uh, of COVID. Um, and so, you know, I think we made great advances. The PEPFAR program in Africa, um, tremendous. I mean, the ability to roll out treatment to people in poor countries like we've just never seen before. So I think we have a lot of lessons learned. I still think we're not quite there yet. and There's still work to be done. Again, thank you, Dr. Gale. So then you spent 20 years, you're supposed to spend two years an internship at the CDC, you spent 20 years. What then draws you to CARE? Well, in between uh, CDC and CARE, I went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I went when they were a very new foundation and they were just starting their global health activities. And because of the work that I had done at CDC uh, on HIV and AIDS, I was recruited there when HIV was one of their absolute highest priorities. Um, but as I continued to, to focus on um, the work that I was doing globally with HIV, uh, you know, again, I recognized that, that you know, there are things that we can do that are medically focused, but a lot of what puts people at risk has more to do with their social and economic status. And so CARE, which is an organization that focuses on global poverty, gave me the opportunity to really think about how do you look at what we now call the social determinants of health, those non-health issues that really are the biggest drivers for disparities in health. You know, whether you have access to a good income and have have economic assets, whether you have access to clean water, safe nutrition, safe neighborhoods, education, all of those things that are as important in determining, um, you know, our health and our health outcomes. So it gave me the opportunity to kind of look at um the broader aspect of things than what I did when I was focused only on public health and what you, the tools that you have in the public health toolkit. It gave me the opportunity to also look at some of these social and economic drivers that are critical for determining people's health outcomes and life outcomes. So that's interesting. So the lessons you learned at care, excuse me, at care, um, you, were you then able to then take those lessons and go on to the Chicago Community Trust? Very similar to a lot of the things that I was looking at when I was working at CARE. How do you work with poor communities to give them the tools to make a difference in, and a sustained difference? And how do you really look at this issue of this growing divide that we have between the haves and have nots? Yeah. And, you know, in Chicago, just like so many cities in our nation, it has a racial dimension. It has a racial and ethnic lens. We know that Black people were systemically kept out of the things that allowed white middle class 
to flourish, home ownership, access to capital to start small businesses, uh, ability to send your children to school because you can uh, use your mortgage as collateral, all these sort of things that you know Black people were kept out of are a large part of why we see the wealth gap today. So we're really working on ways that we can find um, both programmatic solutions, but also policy solutions. How do we make sure that you know, um, the bad policy that got us to where we are today, redlining, you know, uh, some of the things that you know, forbid and, and, or obstructed Black people from having uh, ownership, home ownership. How do we think of those and other policies that can enable uh, communities to be economically empowered? So is one of those aspects then investing in urban areas in terms of developing new businesses and creating entrepreneurs? How, how does that work, Dr. Gale? Yeah, so we, you know, our, our strategy around closing the wealth gap is kind of um, uh, anchored on three different aspects. One, you know, how do you increase household wealth, you know, home ownership, um, starting small businesses, getting people into incomes that have a long-term career trajectory, uh, and how do you make sure you minimize debt so that if people have access uh, to capital, that they aren't so mired in debt that whatever they they save gets taken away. So we're really looking at you know, all the ways in which individuals and households can think about accumulating wealth. Second is how to invest in neighborhoods. So, you know, if somebody is able to buy a home, but it's in a neighborhood um, where the values are going down, that investment in their home isn't going to actually help them create wealth. So we also have to make sure we're, you know, uplifting neighborhoods and incentivizing development dollars for small businesses, for infrastructure, for you know, public safety, all those things that make neighborhoods more appealing. So if you invest in a, in a neighborhood, you're going to you know, have a long-term investment. And then the third is really how do we work with the com community residents themselves to make sure that their voices are heard, their voices are at the table, and they're able to speak on behalf of the things that they know will make a difference for their neighborhoods. So where does that tie in, Dr. Gale, with gun violence, incarceration rates that are just, you know, astronomically high for, for people of color, Black people? How, how do we sort of resolve that, Dr. Gale? Yeah, you know, uh, if I had a simple answer, uh, you know, I guess I'd be collecting the Nobel Prize or, or, or something, and, you know, as we know, yeah. it, it, it is a multi-layered issue. But it's part of the reason why we chose closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap as our, as our kind of core issue, because underlying so many of the challenges that we face, whether it's gun violence, uh, poor health, lack of access to education, et cetera, you know, it, a lot of the fundamentals are the fact that people have been locked out of economic opportunities. You know, you talk to a young person who's involved with violence and they will say, if I had a job, I wouldn't be doing this. You know, I'm involved in violence. I'm involved in crime, which begets violence uh, because I have no other way out. And we've got to give young people particularly a sense of a way out. We got to give them a sense of hope. We have to give them a sense of future. We have to give them a sense that, you know, they can feed their children and they have the ability to hold their head, head up with dignity because they have work that gives them dignity. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, while we do work on violence prevention and some of these issues uh, in the immediate term, we still believe that in the long term, if we can make this economic equity work, that people will have choices that also lead them away from some of these other issues that are you know, core to where our cities are today. So let me ask you this, Dr. Yales, one final question. You've had an extraordinary career and a tremendous impact, not, not only in the United States, but around the world. Tell me, 
what sort of advice, words of wisdom would you give young people today, especially young kids of color, about the, the road and path to success and staying positive uh, and keeping your dreams alive? You know, it's not easy. Um, this is a complicated world and things are only getting more complicated. But I think, you know, just staying grounded in who you are. Um, find your sense of purpose. And, uh, people don't have to do what I did or what you did or, you know, everybody finds their own path. But, but make sure that that's a path that, it, that includes service. Um, I always say to people that I feel like I get more back from what I do than what I give. And that ability to feel like you're touching people's lives uh, is like nothing else. So, you know, I just think everybody finds their own road, but, you know, keep in mind that service is a, is a huge part of it. However you choose to serve, however you choose to find that sense of purpose. And I think if you set, if you find that sense of purpose um, and that connectedness to giving back, uh, you know, you'll figure the rest of it out. Thank you, Dr. Gale. I appreciate your time. Uh, it's an honor and again, privilege to get a chance to talk to you and hear some, uh, some exciting stories about your life. Thank you so very much. Great, thank you. All right, have a great day. This is the Black Experience for all. If you like what you hear at the Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us. This is the Black Experience for all.